Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, listeners all over the world, welcome back to another edition of the Anything Wrestling Podcast, AWP. It has been a while, but we are finally back, and I'm here with the entire crew. We got a triple threat going today. It is the Shant, Dan the Man, and the Kamish. How you guys doing? Good. That's great. Um, okay. Not even an in- What is this? Well, then talk. Well, I was trying to, but I was trying to be polite for him. I gave you guys a seven-second silence, and you didn't say anything. Minus six. What about a five-second right. pose? Can we at least get that? Did somebody say three seconds? Oh, good Lord. So we're here. We are looking to uh, talk about a very controversial move on the WWE's part uh, from the last day or so. And I don't even want to bring this up. But he said we don't even know the meaning of the word controversial. Don't tell him to calm down, Dan. I'm down, Sean. Don't tell me to calm down. Nobody tell. Speaking. Why? Of- Why are you so fired up today, Sean? Well, one reason is because the wrong flare was released. And secondly, I'm just. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm gonna get a little bit emotional. But here's the thing. A little. You've been emotional don't since poke the car drive. The here. bear. I know we had a beer here. End of monologue. Um, we have been on the receiving end of a lot of releases since the beginning of 2021, roughly. I'm not even counting all the releases from last year. But I think this last second to last release was probably the biggest release that probably struck the most controversy uh amongst all the other people, all the guys and girls, you know, producers and referees that were released. For those of you who don't know, and I'm sure everybody does at this point, but in case if you don't, WWE or former WWE superstar Bray Wyatt has now been released from the company. There's a lot of people speculating that maybe he's going to go to AEW, maybe he's going to continue his craft elsewhere. But unfortunately, we have come to the terms of the release of Bray Wyatt. We last saw him... It was an episode of Raw. He was doing an episode of the Firefly Funhouse. He had just lost to Randy Orton. Because witches be wilding. I had to. I'm sorry. Mm Mm-hmm. And so here we are. And I thought that we needed to take a moment to discuss this. Because I think Bray was very intelligent when it came to recreating himself, coming up with something new, turning things around... There was one moment where he was getting so much praise that people thought we have the next Undertaker on our hands. But unfortunately, as I will discuss here one by one, there were some fatal blows that were given to his career, which ultimately put him on the unemployment line. But um, Dan, if you want to get us started, uh, just give us a quick introduction of who Bray Wyatt is, where he comes from, and then we can take it from the top. All right sort this part out uh so bray wyatt known in real life as wyndham lawrence rotunda uh son of mike rotunda and uh nephew of barry and kendall wyndham uh also brother of bo dallas he started out with wwe down in fcw um Initially, as Husky Harris, um, and joined the Nexus version two. The new Nexus, I think yeah. it was. And uh, once that all fell apart, then they rebranded him as basically Bayou Cult Leader Bray Wyatt. He did that for quite some time, from what 2013 to 2018. Yeah. Uh, being partnered up with Luke Harper, Eric Rowan, Braun Strowman, Matt Hardy, Matt Hardy, uh, facing off with Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton, among others. But uh, ultimately, in 2019, we saw the return as the Fiend, which was a long-touted gimmick. Um, he'd teased online a lot. He had painted this whole rebirth following the Lake of Reincarnation uh, situation, and. He comes back as The Fiend and as Firefly Funhouse Bray, as uh, people typically kept them separated. And after this WrestleMania, he just kind of disappeared. 
And you had that one promo where he teased uh, a new season and, you know, feeling like he was reborn. And then we never heard again, never heard again. You saw him partnered with Alexa Bliss. She started to uh, absorb his uh, gimmick. gimmick. And then here we are with the shocking revelation that Bray Wyatt has been let go. Um, and I believe from what I read, the justification that's apparently floating around is budget cuts. People power. Ah, good old Johnny. So let's take a second. Let's take it from the top. So I believe it was in uh, in FCW and in NXT where Bray Wyatt, you know, created Bray Wyatt, and he came up with this gimmick, and it was very sort of Jake Roberts esque, very soft spoken, very uh, unique and different from everybody else on the roster. What did you guys first initially think when Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family debuted in 2013? They came and they were feuding with Kane and they were just this trio faction. Went against the Shield, went against other people. What did you guys first initially think of the whole Bray Wyatt character? The Eater of Worlds Bray Wyatt. What did you guys think of him? I went to a SmackDown event. I remember you telling this. With my dad. Uh... A, a long time ago and it was early on in, in the Bray Wyatt introduction he'd yeah. been showing up he'd been cutting those promos and you're just sitting there and he was he was captivating and even though so at times he, he was a little wordy or you kind of made verbose yeah you may have lost the like core intention you're still yeah. like he did the cult leader thing very well because you're still like you're hanging on his words yeah and it it's because he, whether he made sense or not, <clears throat> believed his own words that he was delivering to you. And you're like, this is amazing. And I'm sitting next to my dad at SmackDown in, uh, I think it was the Joe Louis Arena still. Um, and I'm just, he's up on the, on the Tron. And, I'm, and I turn to my dad and go, this guy is fucking amazing. And... Then it, ju- it became one of those things where sometimes WWE would pull a WWE and just be very slow in their build and yeah. so what as as wonderful as he was at cutting these promos and spinning these webs and making you invested in the emotional core of everything sometimes you'd go four five six weeks in a story where that's what you're looking at and you're like Jesus figure it out <laughs> which is not his fault yeah he was doing what he could overexposure yeah and uh I then then we got the fiend stuff and the Firefly Funhouse was like a different spin on the whole thing and he still you, you, he has a magnetic um, charisma to him yeah and it's very disappointing to fly. it's very disappointing to run to this point I'm now sorry. where he's gone and I'll talk a little bit more about this but I mentioned this right before we came on air was that it. The, the way that this whole thing just played out kind of says that everyone's dispensable. Yes. Because all they did was they went, hmm, we're just going to take his gimmick, give it to somebody else, and then we're cool. He's gone. And it's even the same thing with Braun. Braun was like their, their big guy, and apparently almost is like their new staple big dude. Well, I talked about that before. I was, I, I think it was you that told me where they're like, they now are banking on almost, yeah. which is why they're like, Braun, see ya. Yeah. Off you go. And I'm like, Braun's been with you guys for about six years now. So you dump him and there's this new guy and now he's your golden goose. You're, yeah. you're protecting him. They're very big on the uh, latest toy. Yeah. Flavor of the month. Yeah. Kamish, your initial thoughts on the first time or so that you saw the Eater of Worlds. Yeah. No, that's my reaction, genuinely. i never seen a reincarnation into a different type of character like Bray's since Jake Roberts, since The Undertaker, since these type of gentlemen that have always portrayed this dark aura of mystery and like of like evil incarnate in a way These it's kind of layered characters yes yeah. and and it, he found a way to not only just 
harness both their energies, but you can kind of see like the very early '90s type of darkness with the Undertaker, yeah. the very like dramatic and 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 like you said, uh, very wordful uh, commentary of Jake Roberts blended into one person. And nowadays. Look, when you see new superstars or wrestlers, depending on what brand you watch, you can't really invest into a character so quickly because either they captivate you immediately right from the beginning of their career or, like the crown, this is boring. (laughs) This is boring. And I think with Bray, before he turned into Bray, when he was Husky Harris... yeah. He was still trying to find his identity in, uh, what was it, FTW? FCW. FCW, yeah. I'm sorry. FCW and the beginning of his career in WWE, mm. you know, but it's like, okay, well, I can't just be another big guy. There's there's plenty of them. Hell, even before the new Nexus, there was, um, what did he call himself before he called himself Ryback? Uh, um, Ryan Reeves. Silver? No. Like, wasn't it with something with an Silverback? H? Silverback? Uh, well, either way, you, you get my point. Yeah. There's always this point of, like, I need to be someone who stands out. I need to create a Skip, character. Skip Sheffield. Skip Sheffield, Sheffield, that's what it was. I need to be someone different from the crowd. And what do I do? Oh, let me bring in this character that we haven't seen because I'm sure he knew one day, oh, the Undertaker's going to retire. The Undertaker's going to call it. And, I mean, Jake has been doing his thing recently in all the elite. So who's there to step who's in? New, who's who's going to fill yeah. the shoes? And if not, step into his own pair of shoes and, or wrestling boots and be like, hey, I want you to focus on me now. I want you to see this character that I've created. And I think it literally was the WrestleMania 30 match um, with him against John. Mm-hmm. Where I was like, okay, well, this is the first time I not only am reintroducing myself back to WWE, but this character is crazy. Like, his wrestling style is different from what you've seen from many big guys. He's agile, he's athletic, but he's also doing that thing the Undertaker used to do with his opponents. Let me take things slow, let me, like, play into your brain and and give you the mind games as well. It's kind of like... You see a blend of the Undertaker's slow pace with mankind's like all ability to just psych you out, yeah. and you're just you're entranced by it. Regardless, if of course John had to take the lead, like he usually does. We'll get to that in a but second. you know what I mean. Like yeah. it's it's like you 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 see the psychology and that he's portraying, which is something I haven't seen in a while that got me interested. And to see a guy with such a command of two separate characters. That he's performing at the same time, like it, it's you can draw a vague comparison to Mick Foley, in the Cactus Jack, the Mick Foley, the Mankind, and the Dude Love. He had a noticeably different personality as each of them, and he Finn had Balor. and he had control of that. And Finn, and and even but even with Finn, they dropped the Demon King, just gone. Well, that's the beauty of some of these games. We'll, we'll get into this when we get into yeah. the theme, but a quick note is that that's the beautiful part of having two parts of your gimmick, yeah. is that you can have Mr. Rogers' version of Bray, and maybe the Fiend goes away for a while, so you don't get overexposed to that, and then when the time comes for a WrestleMania, for a SummerSlam, then you bring him, and everyone's like, oh, there he is, you know, because we haven't seen him in a while. Because you would even get this with, like, Finn Balor. What, you get the Prince, and then all of a sudden, you get the Demon... You, you you get this persona and aura change. You're like, oh, this is someone else I'm seeing. Wrestle. Yeah, and it's like, oh, it's a different character. It makes them an attraction. Exactly. Yeah. So Bray comes in, and honestly, what I he was very distinctive. It was different. It wasn't a guy in regular gear coming and trying to be the face or the heel. I could even argue and say that Bray has never really been a face or a heel. He's just kind of been an anti-hero, depending on what you believe and how you see his character. Yeah. Or he wasn't even an anti-hero in that. He didn't really... You didn't... It wasn't black and white with him. him. It was very much a gray area. Yeah. 
Um, so he's on this rise, and okay, we're going, we're going, we're going. We hit WrestleMania 30, 30th anniversary, big attraction. Daniel Bryan's doing his thing. Brock and Taker, it's the streak or whatever. And then you have this. And here's the part where I'm, I'm going to bring up some dirty laundry is that John didn't even have a match until like the second or third week before Mania. So this leads me to believe maybe they slapped this together. But I thought this would have been the perfect opportunity to be like, here's the new Undertaker S character, and we're going with him. But John doing what he does, or WWE, whoever, doing what they do, they said, nope, Bray, you're losing. You're doing the favors tonight. Which, at that point, I felt like John Cena was established. He didn't need that win. If he lost, it wasn't going to be a career killer. But it was very much the opposite for Bray, where if he didn't get this win, okay, you just spent six months building him, and we're going to kill everything. That's what I feel like was the first mistake with the Bray Wyatt character, was feeding him to Cena and not having him come out on top. Your guys' thoughts, what did you guys think? He, I don't even think he wound up winning a match in that feud. Maybe, I think he won the Steel Cage match, but that was due to circumstance. I thought, uh, personally, yeah, the fact that you get the closure six years later, sure, whatever. But the the match itself, it, it was a good match. I'm not saying it's five-star, but it's still a pretty good match to watch. But you're seeing something that is like, okay, this guy is bu- building his own momentum. He's built his group. You've seen these, like, vignettes constantly. And you're like, this guy is finally going to do what we've been wanting to see. Yeah. Just destroy Cena or at least get the victory over him. And it would have been believable with a Bray Wyatt character. If it was an average superstar, you'd be like, okay, not that believable. But with Bray, it would have been very believable because he has that Undertaker-esque... Hell, yeah, you, you, know. you could have still done the whole thing of what he was doing in the match. Like, oh, you know, fulfill your legacy, John. You know, hit me with the chair. Yeah, Do what you have to do because this is what you really are. You could have still gone in that direction, but no. Still gotta paint him as the hero that, like, oh... I can't do that anymore. I can't be that aggressive. I I don't come from that era anymore. So it's like, okay, you get you give him the win and you're just like What did I just see? Because I was expecting this guy to just destroy John Cena at yeah. the get go. But that's not what we happen to see, unfortunately. And he's not a small boy. So mm-hmm. like he's he's believable it's playing believe- with your that's with your I'm big saying. with your yep. big hitters. Um yeah, I know. I agree because that that almost it almost seemed like that was the trend with him, and I know that the hero is always supposed to come out on top, but with the the fifty fifty booking that WWE was always playing yeah. with, and they're non committal to doing anything to building anyone like shit. The Alistair Black release in the middle in of the that middle of that a- return. Um, but you have him, and he goes up against John. He goes up against Taker. He goes up against um, Jericho, Jericho, Brian, Brian uh, Shield, Shield, Orton, all of them. And it was always like the yeah, yeah. <laughs> over and over again, where they would just either let off the let off the gas, or they'd slap the parking brake on. Yeah, <laughs> and he just never, he never got to really run. Yeah. And then you brought in the transition over to the fiend and it seemed like maybe that's what we were getting. There was that the that very clear distinction between the two. Yeah. Where it was like, okay, we've found what he was supposed to be. You've got the fiend now. That is him to, it it was almost supposed to be like he's taken the reins, like we said, of Undertaker. Of that big overarching mythological creature type of character and then we trickle down to and the, the pairing with him and Alexa was fine that that feud with, we'll get it we'll get to it but that feud with Orton was fine yeah it was the most entertaining thing going on on Raw and then and then they they do the whole Wrestlemania mm-hmm. thing and she's now suffering from the same thing yeah because it's been week after week after Over week exposure, after week after same week of her thing. sitting in the playground with Lily. And God bless her. We all love Alexa. She's not as creative. She's not as captivating. As mystical. Yeah. yeah. 
she, does, she, does, she doesn't draw you in in the same way that he was doing. And so it's not the same character. It's just yeah. making Alexa Bliss and somebody who needs an exorcism. If I could bring this up, do you remember the beginning of the Firefly Funhouse? You first said to me, and I quote, and this is when we were recording back at uh, the other quote-unquote studio. The compound. Yes. You said, what the hell is this? This is the stupidest shit I've ever seen. And I told you, wait. Just wait. Each week it keeps getting psychologically worse. (laughs) If not better. For those of us who are intrigued by horrible evilness. Sorry. I have a life. But my point well, being, you weren't interested at first. You thought, okay, this is the worst thing they could have done. And then when you finally started seeing those vignettes transition him into the Fiend yeah. character, you're like, holy shit, what, what are they doing? This is great. This, this might be good. And at one point, when, you, when we all saw it together, we're just like, whoa. They finally uncuffed him. They finally told him, here's the keys of the car. We won't even step in. Go. I sort of had a unique introduction to the whole Fiend thing because the stream, I would watch Raw on the the stream that I was watching it on, and for whatever reason, the stream that I was watching it on completely cut out the the first ever Firefly Funhouse segment. So whenever it picks back up into the arena, I see Bray Wyatt trending worldwide. Now I'm thinking, did he die? So I'm Googling Bray Wyatt, and I'm like, okay, thankfully there is no, like, Bray Wyatt, WWE Superstar, found dead or anything. I'm like, okay, so then why is he trending? Then I go back to WWE's YouTube channel. I'm like, no, don't. Don't put the chainsaw through the... No, don't. Great. But the thing is, as I told him as he was doing it, I'm like, don't think of it as, like, he's killing it off. Think of it as something deeper. There's a deeper meaning, and there's always been a deeper meaning. With Bray, he was very good with planting seeds. He could plant a seed here. You would go six laters down the line and be like, remember him bringing that up? And it's like, he can always draw back. He can always go back. He did that with The Fiend. Yep. He told the story of The Fiend years ago, and no one batted an eye years later until you saw him dressed up as The Fiend. You're like, oh my god, this is exactly what he said so i'm gonna jump a little ahead so after the thing with cena he goes into various rivalries with various superstars and god bless them nine times out of ten he would lose but then i think where we got the second worst blow was that wrestlemania 32 segment with the rock and there he is again john cena where they just they essentially bury not only bray but the entire wyatt family the Rock getting a six-second victory over Eric Rowan, it's like, okay, but why? Like, we could do... We, you can remove that off the record books, and it would not make any difference. Oh, you don't even need to have the moment. Exactly. <laughs> That's where I feel like, once again, it was further burial of the Bray Wyatt character. What did you guys think of that moment? I I agree. Um, that That's the... That, that seemed to be almost the signature move, like yeah. I was saying. Is you would have those, or uh, I'll jump back and then come back to this. Another of those little missteps is the disqualification in the Hell in a Cell, the <laughs> Hell in a Cell match. We'll get into that, yeah. But um, yeah, you build this character up. You put it, it, and it was all. It was like he would get to it, it's Sisyphus, rolling the the rock the the boulder up the hill, and like then never gonna reach the top. Yeah, he would get right there, and then it would roll back down, and he would have to push it back up. He literally met the rock, and he had to fall back down the hill. And as much as I love the rock, as much as I respect John Cena, the 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 deeper problem has always been those in charge of the company. Yes, because even if the rock has a bit of an ego, <laughs> bit of an ego on him, God bless you. and Thank even you. if John has a little bit of an ego on him, a little, they. They are the people who have that say, who could say, we want to actually yeah. put this over. Yeah. And I think somewhere in their brain, they or in the conversation with Vince, they had to come to the consensus, like, come to the, the uh, what's the word? The, where they, make, they make the deal. Conclusion? Concession. Okay. They had to make the concession of, okay, fine, 
I guess us giving him the rub is being in the segment with him. But that do- it doesn't really do anything. Like you can you could put me in the ring with The Rock and John Cena and have The Rock hit me with the rock bottom and it would do the same amount of good as it did for Bray. Yeah. So that's my take on that one. Come is your take on that thirty minute segment that didn't really do anything except bury the Wyatt family? He literally said exactly what I thought the whole time. No, it's it's the truth. It's like, why do you promote someone? Dan. Why do you build? Why do we promote somebody that we believe is gonna carry the reins huh, yeah. into for the company, only to bring them back down? Like, what is the point? Like, it, it's it's mind blowing. It's mind numbing. Yeah. At this point, because you're just sitting there you're like, yeah, not what I wanted to see. I thought I saw this two years ago. I think WrestleMania kind of became a repetitive curse for the character of Bray, because in 30, he lost to Cena, 31 lost to Taker, and in 32, he didn't have a match, but he did have a 30-minute segment where he just essentially got buried. So I don't know if it was just this running joke of how can we outdo the previous year by burying this character... But or do you think it wasn't that they wanted to bury him? It's like, is he the right person for the right place and the right time to bury? In according to Vince's eyes. Well, I mean, when you get the type of reactions that he was getting, when you get you know the adulation that he was getting, I think you got to pay attention to that, you know. Which I mean, obviously now they don't because. Like, I don't want to disrespect anybody when I say this, but you mean to tell me that right now in the WWE, you don't have a position for Braun, you don't got a position for Bray, but you have a position for Eva Marie, who you brought back five weeks ago? I would watch Bray Wyatt go for the women's title. <laughs> Let it out. I don't think that those are necessarily the um, people to draw the comparison to. Let it out. Don't hold back. This is your time. You're telling me... I'll go off what you're saying. You're telling me that... And I I would never want to wish these things on anybody. Yeah. But you're telling me that you've got space on your roster for Damien Priest. And not for Bray Wyatt. And maybe it's a... Maybe. Maybe it's a contractual thing. Maybe Bray was too expensive for their taste. But he sold a lot of merch. He was bringing it in. He wasn't just a drain on your company. Well, that's what I'm saying is when you pay attention to fan reaction, they had that limited uh, Bray Wyatt Funhouse collectible package thing. Yeah. And they, they literally sold out. Yeah. I Like I one time just for, out of curiosity, I clicked on it and it said all sold out. Yeah. Within I think the first day. And it's like, you have a guy who's who has that star power. You could release something for a limited time only, and it sells out. Like, what else, what more proof do you need? So, you go down the line. After that horrific segment with The Rock, he kind of... He's, he kind of reinvented himself a little bit right before the Feeny when he started tagging with Matt and he came back and he had slightly different gear and his hair was kind of braided and you're like, okay, it's something different. But it just felt like every other match he was losing and yeah. there was just no substance there. Now you fast forward to mid-2019 and all of a sudden we get... Firefly Funhouse for the first time. We get, you know, hostess or host Bray Wyatt. And it's like you said, Kamish, it was all these Mr. Rogers esque mini episodes of a kid's show, and there was this hidden meaning behind it, this dark meaning behind it. We go to SummerSlam of 2019, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna draw this out for you guys, because I believe we were watching this all live. The show yeah. was going, and we're like, okay, it's a decent show, cool, all right. Finn Balor comes to the ring. This like The moment after Finn Balor gets to the ring, all the way until Bray Wyatt exits the ring, that chunk of time in the show, 
I think was the most captivating. We went from watching the pay-per-view like this to all of a sudden being like this, you know, with your eyes glued on the screen, paying attention, hanging off of everything that happens. The Fiend comes out for the first time and just demolishes, not Demon Finn Balor, regular Finn Balor. The Prince. Yeah, the Prince. And once again, we're off because he he did the mandible claw on Mick Foley. He did it on Jerry Lawler. He was taking out all these legends and we were getting this buildup. He takes out Finn Balor and I thought it was just a matter of time until we put the title on him. Which we did, but this is where the third shot comes in. Hell in a Cell. Yeah. After 15 curb stomps. Wait, you mean hate in a crate? <laughs> yes. Hate in a crate, rage in the cage, hell in a cell, whatever you want to call it. After 13 curb stomps. Suck it up, bucket. <laughs> Very well. The match comes to an end, and the technical term is via referee stoppage. Yeah. And the first thing that I think is, okay, so Mick Foley could practically almost die in Hell in a Cell. You don't stop the match. And yet, Seth does what he does, and the referee goes, ring the bell, that's enough. And it just killed the momentum of The Fiend. Completely killed it, because then they go to Saudi at Crown Jewel. It didn't, and I and I mean this. Didn't X Pac literally say, "How the hell do you get a disqualification yeah. in a yep. hell in a cell?" Well, again, it wasn't technically disqualified. But they didn't clarify that. They didn't do, like because Seth hit the chair with the hammer. Yeah. The ref calls for the bell. They don't that announce. Was like what? Wasn't it a wrench? I thought it was a no, it was the big little hammer gimmick that he had, and Bray had like a toolbox on him, and he just so yeah, and he no, so they stopped the hammered match, at home, but they don't say by referee stoppage. It's yeah. not on the show. I don't know if they did it after after the show ended on. The I think feed. it was on Raw where they like. But then home. they clarify it. But you, still, you left that question of what in the blue hell did you just do? Go ahead. You can throw McFoley off the top. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. Through it. Through the ring countless times. You can set Edge on fire. You can choke Slammer Kishi backwards into a truck bed. You can backdrop Cactus Jack off of the cell and have him crash through the ring. That's all fine. But a hammer to the head? No, That's... no, no, no. A hammer to a chair. To a head. To the head. I guess that, that's the line, apparently. I guess that's where you just hammer it home. And I think that the problem really? with that whole thing is that exact thing. Is you had Mick go through the top of the cage. He gets hit in the face with the chair. He's got the tooth in his nostril. Oh, God. They start to carry him away. And because they are all consummate fucking professionals... Especially at that time where it was, you'll go back in there. They're all talking to each other. If Mick didn't think he could go on, they wouldn't have gone on. But that was a legitimate thing. He was actually hurt. And they still went, they still wrapped it up. Because what? It, it, it was literally Mark Calloway climbing down the cage. And then as soon as he sees Mick Foley, just limping, literally limping back to the ring. He's like, nope, gotta get back in character as the Undertaker. Gotta climb this bitch. And so you have that, but then with Bray, you have a storyline ass conclusion to the to the match. He, like you said, 15 curb stomps, and he no-sold every single one. And now we pile some chairs on him, and that's enough to actually stop. Please. It, it's it, it's like an what fresh hell is this? It's an insult to the intelligence of your fans. Yes, and it's an insult to the craft of the Hell in a Cell match. If we're being honest, because honestly, that match is designed for one thing and one thing only: violence, and to end a feud, or intensify one even further. <laughs> but anyway, so you proceed past the Hell in a Cell match, and you go to. Here's the thing. If you don't pull the trigger on a pay-per-view like Hell in a Cell... When the, do you do it? The least you could do is pull it at a Survivor Series, at a SummerSlam, at one of those big events. Like the big four. Yeah, one of the big four. Okay. Anyway, it's a Falls Count Anywhere match for the Universal Championship, and Bray goes over. 
And uh, then he moves over to, what does this say, to SmackDown. Because he takes the belt with him to SmackDown because they didn't need draft him. Uh, it says Brock Lesnar quit the brand. So I think he was on he was on SmackDown and he quit and then he moved over to Raw. Yeah. But anyway, so he introduces the new, or he, he goes over with the belt and then he holds the title for a bit and then we get to February 7th. Here we go. And on the February 7th episode of SmackDown, Goldberg... Goldberg um, challenged The Fiend to a match at, what, Super Showdown? Yes. And that is where The Fiend loses his first match. Um, And I think this is the fourth shot that really hurt him. I don't... What was the point of this? You could... Look, you could still have Goldberg come back. You can have him compete. Then he loses to Goldberg, and he goes on... We, that's when we go on to the Firefly Funhouse match. But I don't think you needed to take the belt off him. You didn't have to bring Goldberg in for anything. You could have even... You could have had him hold the belt. He could have done the Firefly, Flem, the Firefly Funhouse nice. match against John, you could have made it for the belt and right, still right, right, right. done it the way that they did it. Right. Say Firefly Funhouse one more time. Firefly Funhouse. Say Firefly Funhouse. Firefly Funhouse. Firefly Funhouse. Firefly Funhouse. Fun Can you say it three times in a row? Falafel? Three times in a row. Three times in a row. Anyway. Oops. We're only... Nine ninety nine. So... You have Cena lose, and he disappears for a long time, uh, and we go, oh, well, this was an interesting concept, and then the rumors start to come up that maybe Wyatt and Randy will fight, and that they might do the same thing, and I think people were excited about the prospect of that, because you like seeing those different layers, that uh, interpretation of different times in wrestling, and then they just said, eh, we're good. We even came up with conclusions that maybe uh, Jeff's... Hardy's alter ego could have taken out the Fiend. Yeah, Fiend the, and Willow. The beautiful yes. part about the Fiend was that he would go back and take kayfabe and integrate it into the storyline. So, for example, when you look at Cena... I'm sorry, have we seen this mysterious thing called kayfabe in a while? No. Very well. But you can see it only on Peacock. Uh, for just only uh, nine... Ninety nine. Is it nine ninety nine? It is. I thought oh. it was four ninety nine. I thought it, yeah, I thought it was cheaper. Okay. I don't know. I got Moving it for free forward, because we're I, not trying to promote them, anyways. I got it for free because I'm subscribed to cable. Anyway, isn't that nice? <laughs> All you need is cable subscription. Okay, we're not talking about Charlotte. Let's get back on track. But you have the fiend. You have the fiend versus John Cena and. Remember, we all thought this was going to be the second cinematic match and they're going to maybe do it in the ring and then they're maybe going to have this twist. The best part of that match, it, it's 15 minutes of subtext. If you're a younger viewer of WWE, you're not. You're going to be like, what am I watching right now? It's subtext with a lot of context. That's what I mean. It. Yeah. If you're a younger viewer, you're going to be like, what fresh hell what, is this? Yeah. What are they, why aren't they not fighting in the ring? I'm but dumb. when you go back and you watch and you see all the little sudden references and the subtext that they have and everything. And you have the thing of the NWO. You have the thing of him trying to build a new Hulk Hogan. Yeah, and the Kurt Angle ruthless aggression segment where Cena's career took off. It kind of goes back to that seed that they planted at WrestleMania 30 where now here we are six years later after the fact... And they're going back and revisiting it, and that's the best part about The Fiend, is that he would change every single superstar that he would feud with. Yeah. What did you guys think of that? Because I thought that was exactly what The Fiend needed to be. It's what I pictured personally what a Firefly Funhouse match was going to be. It's psychological, it's entertaining, it's it's a thrill ride that you have no idea what direction it was going to go, where it was supposed to go. And why it went in this direction, yeah. honestly. Because everyone was like, okay, is this is he going to go? Is this recorded? Is, is this something that they plan to do a live, like one camera? You know, where is this going? Yeah. I, we're, we're on the Zoom call, right? Yeah. Or Google call, whatever the yeah. hell it was. Yeah. And we're all just like... 
What the hell did we just watch for 15 minutes? <laughs> no, like, we. what was the match after? I don't know. Who cares? That's the point. Because this match literally captivated everyone's attention that's at least over 20 years old and has a working knowledge of the WWE. Well, and that's part of the, that's one of the, the things the WWE keeps dicking themselves over with is the fact that who do you think... I played that clip for you before we got on here. Who do you think are the people in that crowd yelling, We want Wyatt. It's not your six-year-old fans. Yeah. It's not your, like, 15-year-old John Cena fans. It's the people who watched this and went, that was awesome. Yeah. Like, people with a comprehending working knowledge. People who understand. Of what they grew up with to what they know of what the product is. Not just with the WWE. Let's be real. Like, Anything you watch, whether it's Ring of Honor, New Japan, um, AEW, All Elite, yeah, or um, Impact, yeah, you watch all these wrestling brands, including the WWE, because okay, I don't watch it as a fan anymore. I watch it as someone who's invested, someone who likes story, someone who likes character build, someone who actually sees more entertainment than what they've ever seen in crappy TV nowadays. Yeah. But it's like you said, it's a literal hit and miss sometimes nowadays. Well, I think it's more times missed than hit, if we're being honest. And it only hits with fans that have knowledge like we do, or at least we'd like to think we do. I can't imagine. And I know that they've been booking for the kids for a long time. But if you think back to when we were, we were young and we started watching... I can't think back to a time where everything felt so disconnected. Yeah. Because everything seemed to tie into each other. Yeah. And that was part of what got you invested. Those longer term bookings. Those things that were layered into each other. The the breadth of the roster. And you grew attachment to it. And that's why we love it to this day. However... I don't look at what's going on right now and expect the children that are fans right now to continue being fans in 10, 15 years. Yeah. They're going to move past it. They're going to go, they're going to get to a certain threshold and go, this is stupid. And, Where's and, Roman Reigns? And granted, we're in an era where attention span is zero. Gone. I'm sorry, yeah. What? Yeah. And. Well, it's proven a point. But yeah, that, no, no. but, and so that's the problem is like they have an opportunity to do that to captivate their audience and bring them in and make them sit there and pay attention and they drop the ball every single time and then you have something like this guy who brings you in who envelops you in the story and the mythos and the ethos and the the emotion of it all and then you just go and we're good oh yeah question are you taking a survey Mm. hey yeah do you see that a character like this, a six-year-old, I'm sorry, should not really be focusing on? Yeah. But if he's a six-year-old with the common knowledge that wants to learn, like an 11... I don't know how old Brody's kid is. Uh, we'll he's say, awfully we'll say, young. We'll yeah, say he's 10. A, he, Let's just say 10, 10 11. for the okay. sake of this. We'll say 11. An eleven-year-old that has the already the mindset that he wants to be what his father was is gonna learn and grow with this, just like any eleven-year-old would with their heroes or whatever they're invested in. Yeah. But to have a character like this draw the attention of mid twenty to thirty-year-olds says a lot. And yes, I I am I am speaking of my, of my age. But the point is, is you haven't had something like this in years. Yeah. And the idea that, oh, well, we, we're still doing this for the kids. He's not for the children, though. What do we do? We need to do something different. Like, no, you you have gold you need in to your be, hands. You need to be well-rounded. If you're tunnel-visioned on... <laughs> this is going to sound weird. If you're tunnel-visioned on children... <laughs> Uh, you're missing an entire an entire world. Like I'm not saying you should focus on the kids only. Like you shouldn't, 
Because obviously you want to draw them in young. But isn't the idea to keep them invested so they grow with this? Kind of like how we've grown with this? Well, you think of it as like a walking sidewalk at, a, at an airport. You need to move along with it. Because while I'm walking on the just on the concourse and somebody else is and the fiend is going down that walking sidewalk, he transitions with me. And if the pacing is different, then he'll eventually move past me. I'll still be here, and something else will catch up to me. Yeah, or you'll catch up to him. Exactly, and it works that same way for the kids because then you need like you can establish something for a kid, but then that needs to grow too. That was one of the complaints about Cena. Cena was stagnant. For 12 goddamn years. I want to bring this up because what you just said, Dan, uh, about two minutes ago about the attention span and kids of today not being fans in 10, 15 years time. So I'll ask a question and you guys will get my point. Name stars in the new generation era. Seth Rollins. No, new generation. Oh, what do you, explain that. That's early 90s before oh. Attitude Era. Hulk Hogan. Macho Man. Ultimate uh, Warrior. Big Boss Man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you keep coming up with the names before me. The Attitude Rock. Era. Austin, Rock, Triple H, Kurt, um, mm. Taker. I would count Kurt as Kurt's Ruthless an up- Aggression. He, well, he's in between. He both. was an upper mid card. Okay, ruthless third. Aggression Era. Give me stars. Randy, Brock, Dave Batista, John Cena. Yeah. Okay. Stars of back then, consistent booking. Consistent growing. Now... There's one guy I can say that's consistently being protected and written for. But you've been saying this the whole episode. Roman. And that's one of the big reasons why when Dan says kids in 10 to 15 years. Because kids are going to grow up. Who did you grow up watching, Roman? You ask us. Who did we grow up watching? The list goes on and on. Even though technically we shouldn't have grown up with the attitude there, but... But we did. That was amazing. Well, here's the thing, is that WWE, they have proven that they can do edgy things, but just making it very subtext innuendo-like. Well, and edgy isn't even the problem. Like, edgy isn't even the thing we need to focus on so much as just quality, because their stuff is so watered down and thin. It's like, I got some Bisquick right there behind you. If you put too much water in that, you're not going to have a good pancake. Yeah. And that's what we got. We got runny, we got runny cakes. Well, specifically, <laughs> with The Fiend, I heard in the beginning that they gave him creative control of his own character. Which yeah. is something that not even any current superstar is granted unless you are Roman or you beg for it. Even for the Firefly Funhouse match, you know, I think Cena and The Fiend were supposed to have a regular match. And then when the pandemic took over, they were like, guys... Put your heads together. Let's let's come up with something. And I think I may be mistaken, but I think Bray had a lot to do with. What if we do this? What if we explore this? What if we bring this back and make it a part of the match? And the fact that Cena volunteered and was was a team player for that is beyond amazing. And but, he he had even been complimentary of the guy. Yeah. He he saw in Bray the Six same years th- later. But this, yes. Yes. But he saw in Bray the potential and the the the, the depth of that character. Yeah. That you saw people like X Pac and all those people chiming in and saying, "This guy's money. This dude is the future." Da 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 da. And now he's not in that company anymore. And we made the vague references recently of uh, there was the thing where Vin- Vince made the comment about, uh, "Well, I don't even see AEW as competition. Uh, I mean, I guess we could Old we bastard. I guess we could just try giving him more talent." Yeah, because you, you you've already given them enough. You don't know what you're doing with your own people. You are now releasing them, and they are going to these other companies. And you may not, in your old man brain, see, now. see it as a threat, but it is. It's going to be. Because people like us... I don't watch the stuff regularly from WWE anymore. Granted, I also don't watch AEW. Um, that, I, I don't either. But I watch, I'll watch occasional clips. But like, the, even the people that I like, Alexa. For a while, I was keeping up with the Alexa's Playground and Lily stuff, and I'm tired of it. Well, I'm that's over it. You, you've grown tired of it. Yeah. Because it's not substance anymore. It's not. And they're so you. slow. Like, they're so slow. Even Roman and Edge, I'm like, okay, cool. Can we get to the point? I'm sorry, it's now Seth and Edge? 
Seth, wait, you're right. Se- but do all you, of do them. Do you hear this, people? I don't even know what's going on anymore. And you're the same way. You tuned out of like keeping up with the stuff on on a regular basis for a while ago. Oh, I have. You go back and forth sometimes as to how much you pay attention to to it in the moment. You're supposed to lead this podcast. You're supposed to lead the example of this for our whatever fan and base And that we have. shows how weak of a job they're doing. Well, let's... Because you've got so many, like, potent talents now in the other companies that it's going to come back to bite them. And here's the thing. Those companies... They're not even on the whole thing of, hey, let's all take them out anymore. Yeah, they're, they're focusing on their, own... on their own thing. Exactly. <laughs> what is we haven't done this in a while now. Yeah. They have they've stopped with the whole subliminal shots, the whole, oh yeah, we're still gonna poke at you. No, they don't care anymore. They're focusing oh yes, yeah, that guy came from WWE. Okay. That's it. He's that, doing his own thing now. That's the only point of reference. So, let's get into the, I think, the, the, the straw that broke the, the camel's back. So, basically, essentially, everything post-Firefly Funhouse match. Post-Firefly Funhouse match. Two because, is released. Yeah. Because there is something I do want to talk about in this in regards to mental health. Okay. Of, there's something I've been hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. Um, so, from after the Firefly Funhouse match, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, whoever... Um, you know, he was feuding with whoever he was feuding with, and then Roman comes back, uh, takes the title off of off of the fiend without pinning him, um, and like it, it was, it seemed like once again, okay, we were building momentum, and then we were just kind of stationary until we got to TLC of last year, where we got that match, and the fiend was burned alive, um, which I thought was entertaining. If I'm being honest, I thought that that whole match was fun because it was Randy tuning into the sick Viper character of before. And it was the buildup of the Fiend who you, you've you just burned and it's almost an excuse of a reincarnation of the Fiend. You need to either an even more demonic yeah. character or just back to a rebirth. Yeah. Of the original originality you brought us. Yeah. So we go from that point of TLC right before Mania, I think was the most entertaining. Like the Fiend, Alexa, and Randy. The stuff that those and they were doing something different each and every week. It wasn't just cut a promo, talk on the screen, cut a promo, talking on the screen. It was different things. It was intergender matches. It was kind of uncomfortable segments where Alexa would be like burn me you burned him so now you're gonna burn me and you would see Randy being resistant and then Alexa would come out the next week and shoot Randy in the face with a whatever fireball fireball they were doing all these things and I'm gonna be honest that was the most intriguing match that I was looking forward to pre-Wrestlemania I was like what what are they gonna do I thought the fiend was gonna kill Randy I was like it's a minute and 20 seconds He's going to do his thing, do the claw, go home, that's it, we're done. Which would have been fine. And then once again, we, Alexa turns on the Fiend, which was fine, which was okay. Now, he also, he came back from being the burned Fiend, and he looked clean. Yeah. (laughs) Like, they tidied him up. And then, yeah, you have that, you have Alexa up on the -the jack-in-the-box with the the black goo. The black goo. And but even that we haven't gotten a damn payoff on. And then you get so, do the math. Thirteen, fifteen curb stomps, he kicks out. One RKO. And he loses clean. I think that that was essentially the the fatal blow. I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Was okay. So you just beat the fiend. It wasn't even a long match. It was like a six minute match. An RKO later, the Fiend has just been defeated again. And it's like, okay, what do we do now? The Fiend doesn't show up. A regular Bray Wyatt comes on the screen and goes, it's time to make new friends. It's time to move on. And then we don't see him for quite some time. And One then, tweet. Yeah. Y'all miss me? Yes, we did. Um, and then 
three days ago, we get the the official announcement that former WWE superstar Bray Wyatt has been released. Thoughts? I mean, what did you guys think of essentially the demise of The Fiend? That build-up of a match with, with Randy, which was fine. Losing the match, having one Firefly Funhouse episode written off TV, fired. To quote the late, great um, Padme Amidala, so this is how The Fiend dies, with thunderous applause. Um, the fact that it was just a whimper, and we finish the WrestleMania thing, and then he just vanishes, and then he's just gone. It's so underwhelming. So under- underwhelming. And for the character to now be living on in Alexa and be so underwhelming in that regard as well, is it's, it's uh, depressing. The only thing I can hope, and like I feel like he's like a, he's like a WWE ride or die in his heart, but... Shit, dude, go to go to AEW. I know that they don't really want. I, from what I was reading, they don't really want to put somebody new at the as like the the Brody Lee figure of that Dark Order or whatever the faction was. Yeah. But like, let the man run wild. He, he you have to rebrand him, obviously, because I'm sure the Fiend is trademarked. Is trademarked, so yeah. But you just change the name, call him the the, the I don't know the guy. And, uh, oh yeah, it's the guy, he's coming to the ring. Um, but he, he can be a game changer. Especially given the fact that Brian and possibly Punk are also going there. I'm sorry, I know you said it needs to happen in WWE, but it needs to happen somewhere else. It needs to, I'm sorry. But going back... To who we're talking about. There's been this these rumors circulating that the reason why he was off TV, the reason why he wasn't making appearances in WWE is because supposedly he was still dealing with his best friend's death, with Brody's yeah. death. Yep. And he even told them, I'm not mentally prepared to come back right now. I, I'm dealing with this. I need to deal with this. I need to heal. And it's like, okay... Did this have something to do with people power as well? Like, yes, we're hearing the rumors of budget cuts, but did it also have to do with the fact that, I don't know, maybe the old man doesn't believe in people suffering from mental health problems or anxiety or stress? Because remember, the old man still thinks it's 1980. Stupid. It's like, no, we're in a new era where, yes, k was dead. Yes, we have superstars who try their hardest to promote all their outside venues, just like any other celebrity does, because they know whatever field they're in is not always going to make them money. So they have different venture capitals to deal with. Yeah. Um. So for the fact that Bray has to is literally telling people, "Hey, I have something I need to personally deal with," and if this is a key factor of what caused the release to me it's like okay you you guys pulled a shitty move in my part in my belief because it's like you can't let someone grieve these two were brothers these two were good friends they they worked in wwe for so long bray was happy that brody got what he wanted in the end uh, his release to to go venture off elsewhere into new career findings and was Brody succeeding in all of the yeah they put a belt on him and they put a belt on and the guy who is literally the EVP of their company who had that belt for the time being was more than happy to do the favor this is the same guy mind you who at first wanted to take shots at WWE and say hey I'm going to create a company that's going to kick that company's ass But the fact that he was willing to do the favor for a former WWE wrestler, or I'm sorry, superstar, is one thing. It's another that Brody got to do it, and yes, Brody passed away, but you can't allow his friend to grieve. You can't allow his other friends to want their release because they need to grieve. It's BS. 
there's a generational difference too between the Vince McMahon the Vince McMahon of the world and the current era of wrestlers you've got a lot of these guys like Cody and Kenny and uh, Bray and and, yeah who and Jericho even who is not from their time but still understands the concept that you will put out a better product and you will put on a better show if you work collaboratively if you work together to generate a creative force worth watching and worth caring about if you care about it so will the people watching. Yeah. Meanwhile, Vince is like, yeah, let's put Eva Marie in a pair of panties and we'll slap her out on TV. Great. I, I, feel, I do feel a little bit bad that we've poked so much fun at her, but Jesus. Um, the, but the fact of the matter is you've got all these guys over in the other companies who want to work together. I'm not doing it. I know you want me to, but I'm not going to. Go ahead. Who want to work together, want to make a good product, want to make a company that's for for the people. Not the people power, just for the people. And then you've got WWE who's so set in their damn ways and we're constantly, we're making that reference going, Vince, step down, step aside. Because the only way that that company is going to survive is if somebody else takes the reins. Not the Roman reins, but the reins of the company. And who do we have in mind? Is it supposed to be Triple H? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. It's time to play the game. Because I'm done playing. We need change. We need growth. And we need to put faith in these creatives to put something out. Because otherwise you're going to lose your fans. You're going to lose your long-term fans. You're losing them already. Well, here's the thing. is that a- because of stubbornness. How, many, like, how fresh can you keep a product with only one brain? You can't. You can't I'm do sorry, it for that long. That brain is decaying. If you had the Bray Wyatt's of the world who were more than happy to contribute and be like, yeah, I'll pitch in. I can, if I can have some creative control, I can tell you where this character should go and what it should do. I'm not saying that whatever Bray says is going to be what's best for the character, but if, you're, if you can experiment, why not? Well, and furthermore, people are more willing to do what you want if you give them a justification for yeah. why or the end game. But the way that that company seems to be run is, we're going to have Bray Wyatt lose tonight. Why? Why not? Dan. Why not? Anyway, <laughs> my Pokemon now? Anyway. Are you? Wobbuffet. Wow. Um, and so, you have the, uh, again, the other companies. They want to put together a product. They're willing to talk to each other and say, this is why I think I need to win. This is why I'm cool giving you the win. This is why we need to build the story this way. This is why we keep a track record of who wins. This is why we have a track record to pro- push the next guy who's ready. This is why we do things this way. This is why things are changing from 1980, from 1990, from 1996, from 2000. Shall I keep going? Yes. 2003, what? 2005, 2007. Oh, that was a dark no, year. No, we don't have to. 2008, go. 2010, 2011, 2013, mm-hmm. 14, 15. What? Now. What? What? <laughs> you forgot 19. What? So the point is that people are stifled they aren't given direction the company just does stuff day to day you got those same day script re- script rewrites yeah they're just throwing spaghetti at the wall seeing what sticks as opposed to planning out what you're doing and why are we throwing mom spaghetti hey man makes my knees weak arms are heavy too so anyway I'll hand it back over to you guys because I went on a vaguely impassioned rant there. No, no it's, it's it, fine. It, it, I welcome it's hitting, it. It's hitting I, a I, nail on the coffin if you think about I it. I couldn't help but lose myself. Yeah. God. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Here, I'm going to... I brought this up one time before and I heard this in an interview and I heard the man say it himself and from that point to now I thought about it and I said, if Vince could just think this way, the product would be a whole lot better. Backstory. When it was Hogan versus Warrior, I know WrestleMania six, one of your favorites, 
Hogan asked Vince and said, who's winning? And Vince says, well, we're going to go with Warrior. The two questions that Hogan would always ask is who, who's winning and where do we go from here? That way you plan. Well, for example, in that case scenario, well, if Hogan wins, maybe we'll go this way. Well, if Warrior wins, maybe we'll go this way. And I think that you always need to have those parameters planned. Is that who's winning? Well, if person A wins, we can maybe go this way. If person B wins, we can maybe go this way. And going back to your point, Dan, I, that doesn't exist now. It just feels like, okay, well, yeah, second match here, okay. Mm, no, no, it exists. It exists. Hell, it exists to the point that they're not only planning their next move, they plan their next five moves. It's called NXT. Yeah. I was going to say... Because Hunter doesn't plan, oh, after uh, Karrion Cross, who's going to go next? He, Let's he, use Karrion as an example real quick. The dude's built as your champion in NXT. He's antagonizing the leaders of that that uh, show. He is your top dog, and then you have him lose three times. Well, he was supposed to lose three times in a two row. Two times to main roster veterans, I believe. Yeah, he they bring him up to Raw for a couple weeks, and they keep making him lose. I think there was even a rumor that a lot of the NXT talent was like, what are we doing? Yes. Like, because that, that's our guy. He comes from where we come from. That's our champion. What the hell are you doing? Like, why are you burying him already? Yeah. But I will say this. The one part about The Fiend being released, and if, Dan, if you could do me a favor and pull up the Mickey James tweet, because I, I want to reference that real quick. I told you guys right before we started recording was that a lot of the times WWE superstars or former WWE superstars will go, oh, these fans, they think they know what's best. WWE knows what they're doing. And it's such a breath of fresh air to see that former... I don't care. Every, anybody could say, oh, Mickey James is just bitter because of the whole trash bag incident. I was so happy to read this because it, I almost felt like the, a former WWE superstar sees it. They understand where we're, us fans are coming from. We're not just sitting here ranting about something that's irrelevant. Mickey James put out a tweet, I believe the day of, where she says... Because, you know, they released a statement of um, we've come to the terms of the release of Bray Wyatt. Yeah, yeah, Best yeah, of yeah. luck in his future endeavors. Okay, good job, Johnny Ace. I think what you meant to say was thank you so much for coming up with such an incredible gimmick time and time again. Once so cool and over, we really didn't know how to book it right. So we just gave it to someone else so we can still make all the money off of it and let you go. If someone like Mickey James who's been released can throw that out there and can say that, what does that say? That it's not just us fans, it's not just us outsiders who are on the outskirts of the company watching the weekly programming. It goes to show that even the people who've been on the inside of it understand how big of an impact this has. Because I will, you guys know this, I hold Undertaker in such high regard. I have for such a long time. I truly believe that Bray Wyatt was your next Undertaker S character? Yeah, there's been Alistair, there's been Mordecai, there's been all these people who've tried it, and okay, God bless them. I'm not discrediting it, but yeah, I just if people on the inside are expressing the same passion that we are, that you guys had, you're essentially next money maker. Yeah, this gimmick of the Fiend and Bray Wyatt, I think, was the most unique. God bless everybody on the roster. Everybody's got their gimmick, and it's distinctive, and it's different. But this one was out there. This one, you can go in so many different directions. I Like I said, you can have Bray Wyatt come on TV for six weeks, and then you bring the Fiend out when everybody least expects it. You could bounce off of that. It wasn't just one-dimensional. Yeah. And the fact that you're like, budget cuts, off you go, see ya, good luck. It's like, do you do you even realize what you're doing at this point? At first, I was like, okay... Again, God bless everybody, but the Sarah Logans and the Eric Rowans, it's like, okay, lower tier talent, they're not really being used, off you go. But Bray Wyatt? You're telling me you had nothing for Bray Wyatt? There was nowhere you can go with this character? Yeah. Again, they don't have room for Bray, but they got room for the evolution. Well, speaking of them making room... You're doing it again. I'm just bringing up a fact. You're doing it again. Don't do drop me. Go. You're going to get dropped out of nowhere. Would you please just go? 
Because the point I want to bring up is uh, a, a fascinating thing that's trending right now is um, the the strange coincidence that Randy Orton uh, just happens to be the guy who last touched at least five people before they left the company and went to AEW. Who were these five people? Those five were Matt Hardy, Mark Henry, Christian, Big Show, and Ric Flair. Um... He technically, I guess, hasn't gone yet, but he's gonna. Let's let's be real. If Bret Hart was there, even as an appearance, Ric Flair will be there. Why? Hart Anderson, Cody Rhodes. That's all the reason you need for Flair to be there. But then, obviously, we've got the Fiend as uh, his most recent conquest. So it'll be fascinating to see. If uh, he follows the buzzards over to AEW. Kamish, your final sentiments about The Fiend. I will say this. You guys had lightning in a bottle. Yes. And you literally let it go to waste. You had possibly the greatest reinvention of a new character... That I think I have not seen in such a long time. And you let it go to waste. Shame. Shame them. Shame us. Final thoughts. Final thoughts on The Fiend. Bray Wyatt. I think you said it best. It was lightning in a bottle. It was unique. You had your essentially next top heel, anti-hero... Character. character character and you squandered it will we see a Samoa Joe where maybe the fiend comes back I don't know if we're being honest I I, I personally think I don't think he should go to AEW Just because again the purpose of having him take over the Dark Order doesn't make sense to me oh, yes I would can, make him do that you can but... recreate the Wyatt family, if he owned the rights, but I'm I'm sure he doesn't. He doesn't, yeah. I personally think he should just do his own thing. Do you, I, it doesn't even have to be wrestling. I brought it up to you guys. I said, I think Bray always knew deep down that he was going to scratch the surface. the surface, but he was never going to be placed on that pedestal. Because you look at it, every single event that I brought up today, the WrestleMania match with John, the segment with The Rock, the Hell in a Cell, the Goldberg match, the match with Randy, those were all moments where he's got it. No, we're going to bring him down. Six months of buildup, he's got it. No, we're going to bring and him down. And it's all with people who had had their time. Exactly. And those people believed in him too. Those Six people. years later, some of them, but yes. One of them. Which we can't see. Who? Exactly. Final thoughts? We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay. So there you go, guys. We just discussed the career, the good times, the bad times of Bray Wyatt, The Fiend, The Eater of Worlds. Uh, Let us know what you guys think in the comment section below. And we will catch you all on the next episode.